أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحابته ومن تبعهم بأحسن إلى يوم الدين اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى سيزن القرآن يوم لا ينفع مال ولا بنون إلا من أتى الله إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم On that day which means the day of judgment nothing will benefit the human being neither wealth nor children only the one who brings to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a sound heart the sound heart or al-qalb as-salim is a heart that's free from the defects and the spiritual blemishes so this heart actually is is considered the spiritual heart and not the physical heart although the spiritual heart is centered in the physical heart one of the extraordinary things about the modern era is that we're finding out things about the heart that w- that were previously unknown to peoples who went before us. Although we can see within the ancient traditions, for instance in the Chinese tradition, in Chinese medicine, the heart houses what's known as Shen, which is the spirit. And the Chinese characters for thinking, thought, love, intending to listen, and virtue all contain the ideogram for heart. So the ancient Chinese knew that. Also, in almost every culture in the world, people use metaphors that deal with the heart. We call people in English hard-hearted people, people who have hard hearts. In other words, they're cruel people. Somebody who has a cold heart or somebody who has a warm heart. We talk about people wearing their hearts on their sleeves. In other words, they don't hide their emotions. They don't hide their states from other people. We talk about also the idea of he affected me in my heart or in my core. In fact, the English word core, which means innermost, in Arabic the equivalent is called lub, actually comes from the Latin word, which means heart. So the core of the human being is, is the human heart. And also the word uh, courage is from the same root word. So courage being centered in the heart. We, the, the, the most ancient uh, Indo-European word for heart means that which leaps. And there's an idea of the heart beating or leaping in the breast of man and also people say for instance uh, that their hearts skipped a beat when they saw somebody people whose hearts when they're in love uh, they often express things uh, in terms of the heart uh, he stole my heart or she stole my heart so many many metaphors that are used in terms of the human heart now the ancients were aware of spiritual diseases of the heart and this is certainly at the essence of the Islamic teaching in fact one of the first things that the Quran immediately sets out is to define three types of people the mu'minun, the kafirun and the munafiqun the mu'minun are people whose hearts are alive and the verse that indicates that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا أَوْ مَيْتًا فَحْيَيْنَاهُ وَجْعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا يَمْشِي بِهِ فِي النَّاسِ The one who was dead. In other words, they were dead, their hearts were dead. And also, uh, and so they were revived with faith, and then they were given a light that they walk with it amongst human beings. Also, the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, which is, uh, الفرق بين الذي يذكر الله والذي لا يذكر الله كالفرق بين الحي والميت the difference between the one who remembers Allah and the one who doesn't remember Allah is like the difference between the living and the dead. So the, the mu'min is somebody whose heart is alive. The kafir is somebody whose heart is dead. And the munafiq is somebody who has a disease or a sickness in the heart. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضَ فَزَادَهُمْ اللَّهُمْ مَرَضَ In their hearts is a disease, and so they were increased in their disease. And this is also in accordance with another verse that says, فَرَمَّا زَاغَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ أَزَاغَهُمْ اللَّهُ When their hearts deviated, Allah made them deviate further. So when somebody turns away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes them to divert even further, to deviate even further from the truth. Now the physical heart, 
which is centered slightly to the left of the human being. And it's interesting also that the Arabic language itself is a, a movement from left to right. Some of the, the people of Ishara indicated that, 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 that writing is, should be towards the heart. In other words, the whole purpose of writing is to affect the heart. This is also the reason why the tawaf or the circumambulation around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is done with the left side facing the house. Some of the scholars have said because that the heart inclines towards the left and so the purpose is that the heart is inclining towards the Kaaba or towards that centrality of the divinity and the life of man. Now, the actual physical heart, which is beating in our breast, beats at about 100,000 times a day. It's pumping two gallons of blood per minute and over 100 gallons per hour. If you actually took 100 gallons of water and moved them physically with your body from one place to another, by the end of it, you'd be quite exhausted and yet this human heart is pumping two gallons of blood per minute over a hundred gallons per hour 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year for an entire lifetime the vascular system that it's sending this life-giving blood is over 60,000 miles long in other words more than two times the circumference of the earth so the the blood is actually being forced through the body over 60,000 miles of vascular, uh, of vascular system in the human body. Now one of the interesting things also about the heart is that we know that it, starts, it, it actually starts beating before the brain is formed, which means that the heart has its own beat. In other words, the heart itself begins to beat without any central nervous system. Now the dominant theory is that the central nervous system is what's controlling the entire human being uh, from the brain. And yet we know now that the nervous system does not initiate the beat of the heart, that it, it's actually self-initiated. And we also know, or we would say initiated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also we know now that the entire heart, all of the, the connections to the brain can be severed in a heart transplant and another heart can be put into a human being's body and the, and the heart continues to beat without any connection to the brain whatsoever because we cannot regenerate nerve cells. So the fact that the heart itself is the, not only the center of the human being but it is not uh, beating because of the brain, uh, because of the central nervous system. Now, another interesting thing about uh, the brain is that the human being, uh, there are many actually people that think that the, the brain is also the center of consciousness. And yet, the Quran very clearly states, لَهُمْ قُلُومَ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا They have hearts that they don't, they're not able to think with, or they're not able to understand with. And... So the, the understanding from that, according to the Muslims, is that the center of the intellect, the center of human consciousness, is the heart and not the brain itself. And it's only recently that human beings have realized that there's, there are over 40,000 neurons in the heart. In other words, there are actually uh, cells in the heart that are communicating, and these there's actual, now there's understood to be a two-way communication between the brain and the heart. In other words, the brain sends the heart messages, but the heart is also sending the brain message. And these things are only recently being discovered. There was a study done by two physiologists in the 70s, John and Beatrice Lacey, that found that the brain actually sent messages to the heart, but the heart did not automatically obey the messages. Sometimes it speeded up, and other times it slowed down indicating that the heart itself has its own type of intelligence. Now, the brain gets signals from the heart that reach the amygdala, the thalamus, and the cortex, which relates to emotions. Uh, the, the cortex, the neocortex, relates to learning and reasoning. And these are only recently discovered, and we don't fully understand them. But what we do know is that the heart is an extremely sophisticated organ, and it's also, according to the hadith, it's a source of knowledge. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam said that wrong action is what irritates the heart, and you do not desire other people to see it. So the heart actually knows wrong action, and this is one of the reasons why people can do 
terrible things, but ultimately they're affected. If you look, for instance, in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, what uh, the, the brilliant Russian author was indicating in that story was that the crime itself is the punishment because human beings have to live with the results of their actions. And that the soul, when somebody does a crime, when somebody does something that is against the heart, is against the soul, then that actually affects the human being to the degree that they will go into a state of spiritual agitation and they will use many, many ways to cover this up. This is what kufr is. It's a covering up. They will use alcohol. They will use drugs. They will use sexual experiment. They will use all uh, seeking power, seeking wealth, seeking fame, all of these ways to try to, to basically to go into a state of heedlessness, into a state of submersion into the world that makes us forget our essential nature, that makes us forget our hearts. And so people become very cut off from their hearts. Now one of the things about being cut off from the heart is that the more cut off from the heart you get, the sicker the heart gets because the heart needs nourishment. And heedlessness is basically starving the spiritual heart. When you go into a state of unawareness, of lack of awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of your ultimate concern, which is the akhirah, the, 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 the infinite world in relation to the finite world, that we're only in this world for a temporary period. And so that when you look at the infinite world in relation to the finite world, suddenly your concerns become focused on the infinite world and not on the finite world. And yet, when somebody is completely immersed in the finite world, believing that they will be here forever, believing that they will not be taken to account for their actions, that this action in and of itself ultimately leads to the spiritual death of the heart. But before it dies and then becomes putrid and, and, and completely foul, it will show many symptoms. And these are called the diseases of the heart. These are the spiritual diseases of the heart. Now, these diseases are divided into two. There are two types of diseases. The first are called shubuhat. And these are diseases that relate to the understanding. So, for instance, if somebody is fearful of their provision from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they actually, they're afraid that they won't get their, their food for the day or their provision, this is a disease of the heart because the, a sound heart has trust. A sound heart actually trusts in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a sick heart has doubt. So the sound heart trusts in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala absolutely. And this is why the heart is actually, the heart does not worry. The heart, it's the nafs, it's, it's the ego of the human being, it's, it's shaitan, it's the, the caprice, the hawa, and, and dunya, the love of this ephemeral world, that all lead to this state of, of fear, of anxiety. The heart in and of itself is actually an organ designed to be in a state of stillness, but the stillness will only come about by the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'inna al-qulub. Isn't it by the dhikr of Allah that the heart is stilled? That this is what the heart wants. It wants to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when, when Allah is not remembered, when human beings forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what happens is the heart goes into a state of agitation. It goes into a state of turmoil and it gets diseased because it's not being fed. Just like the cells need life-giving oxygen in order for, we need to breathe. If we stop breathing, cells die, and we die. The heart also needs to breathe, and the breath of the heart is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what feeds the heart. This is what nourishes the heart. The company of, pe of good people is the food of the heart. The, 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 the exercise of the heart, all of these things are necessary for the heart to be sound and healthy. And this is basically what the Qur'an has come. It's come to remind people that their hearts need to be nourished. And, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the, the, the human being that will be in a good state in the next world is the one who brings a sound heart. Now we enter into the world basically in a state of fitrah or a state of, of the original nature, the inherent nature of the human being. And then we learn to be anxious. We learn anxiety from our mothers. We learn anxiety from our fathers. We learn anxiety from our society. 
all of these things. And this is why the human being is created in a state of anxiety. Uh, that the, the human being is literally created. Uh, the Quran says that we're created in a state of hala. And, and this state of hala, which is anxiety, is uh, the, the, the one group of people that are removed from the state are illa al-musallin, the people who are people of prayer. They're people of prayer. And this prayer is not the prayer of five times a day, but there are people who are الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَرَاتِهِمْ دَائِمُونَ They're always in a state of prayer. They're always in a state of connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the highest station. This is the station of people who do not, neither buying nor, nor commerce, diverts them from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're the ones who remember Allah standing, sitting, and reclining on their sides. These are the people who are, who are not the, the people of ghafla. They're not the people of heedlessness. So this first disease, type of disease, are, these are called shubuhat. And then the second type are called shahawat. And the shahawat are the desires. They're the base desires of the self. For instance, food, sex. The, the, these, are, these are shahawat. These are appetites. And these are also diseases when they're out of proportion to their natural state. And basically what we have in Islam is we have a method or a means by which our hearts can be, become sound, they can become safe again. The, the Prophet وسلم, they said that the dhikr that he did more than any other dhikr was, Ya Muqaddim al-Qulub, Thabbit Qadbi ala deenika, O turner over of the hearts, make my heart firm on your deen. And so this is basically what Muslims uh, have to be reminded of. Now, we have a text here which is known as Matharat al-Qulub. Mathara is what's known as Ism Makan. It's, it's the place, or it's, it's also a, it's a tool uh, by which uh, the, the, uh, the, the Tahara comes about. So Mathara itself is, is a tool by which, and, and this, is, this is what this book is. It's the alchemy of the hearts. It's how to transform the heart. And it was written by a great scholar, Sheikh Muhammad Mawlud al Musawi al Yaqubi al Muritani. He's from Mauritania. He was a West African, a brilliant scholar who mastered all of the Islamic sciences and also mastered the inward sciences of Islam and then wrote this didactic poem in order to teach people the means to purify their heart. And he, the reason he said that he wrote it is because he looked around and he realized that everybody that he saw had a diseased heart. And he felt that, that people learn uh, abstract sciences of Islam, like grammar and rhetoric and, and logic. A and yet, those things they might really not have a great deal of need for. Whereas the heart, given the fact that on Yom al the heart is the only thing that we're going to be asked about, the state of our hearts. It's the only thing that's going to benefit us. Because... In the Malamaru bin Niyat, actions are by intentions. So even your actions are rooted in intentions. And Mahalun Niyat al Qalb, the place of intention is the heart. So every action that you do, in fact, is rooted in your heart. And this is why, in reality, when you're asked about your actions, you're asked about the intentions behind the actions. And given the fact that intentions emanate from the heart, what you're being asked about is the human heart. And so when he realized that, he said, suddenly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired him to write this text. And he based it upon many of the previous texts that had gone before. Imam al-Ghazali, Hujjat al-Islam, the proof of Islam, Imam Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, uh, in the Ahya, Ulum al din his famous book, The Revivification of the Sciences of the Deen, is a book that he actually wrote uh, in order to purify people. And this is why the, the fourth section of the book, which is the final section, is, is Al-Munjiyat wal muhrikat those things that save us and those things that destroy us. And m many of them deal with the heart. And, so, and the first book is Kitab Al-Ilm, which is the book of knowledge, and knowledge is centered in the heart. So really every book uh, in the 40 books that are in the Ahya Ulum al -Din are all basically about rectifying the human heart. If you look at the world today, the tribulations, the trials, every war that we have, every, every, every bit of suffering all over the world, it's rooted in human hearts. The reason that people aggress against other people is out of diseases of the heart, covetousness, desire, the, the, the desire to conquer, the desire to, 
exploit other people, the desire to steal their natural resources. All of these things are from diseases of the heart. A diseased heart cannot do that. Every murderer, every rapist, every idolater, every foul person, every cruel person, every person that shows any act of cruelty, all of this is emanating from diseased hearts. If the hearts were sound, none of these actions would be a reality. And therefore, if we want to change our world, we don't change the world by attempting to rectify the outward. We change the world by rectifying the inward because the inward precedes the outward. All of the, everything that we see outside of us is in reality coming from the unseen world. It, 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 it's from the unseen world that the phenomenal world emerges. And it's from the unseen realm of our hearts that all actions emerge. And so if we want to rectify our actions, we have to first rectify our hearts. One of the things that the, the famous uh, American uh, preacher and, and, and civil rights activist Martin Luther King said was that in order for people to, to condemn injustice, they have to follow four four stages. The first stage is, in fact, they have to I indeed ascertain that there's injustices being perpetrated. In other words, they have to point that out. And in his case, it was the injustices against the African American or the black people in the United States. The second stage was to negotiate, to go to the oppressor and to demand justice. If they refused, then he said the third stage was self-purification. In other words, we have to ask ourselves, are we, are we ourselves wrongdoers? Are we ourselves oppressors? And this is something, the fourth stage then was to, to take action once, you, once you'd actually looked into yourself. Now, one of the things that the Muslims of the modern world really fail to recognize is that all of the, the things that are happening to us, all of these terrible things that we're seeing, it seems that we don't want to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, why are these things happening to us? And if we ask that in all sincerity, the answer will come back in no uncertain terms that this is all from our own selves, that we have brought all of this upon ourselves. And this is the only empowering position that we can take, and this is why this is the Quranic position. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says quite clearly that He makes the oppressors, some of them, he puts over others. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that some of the oppressors, we put them over other oppressors because of what their hands were earning. And what that verse is telling us is that, according to Fakhruddin al-Razi, he says that this means that whenever there's oppression in the earth, it's a result of other people's oppression. So those people who are aggressed upon are in fact being aggressed upon because of their own, uh, their own oppression. Now, this is obviously uh, not the case uh, for tribulation. There are definitely times when mu'minun are tried. But if they respond accordingly with patience and perseverance, Allah will always give them victory. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca. Uh, there's no doubt that they were being oppressed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory. Within 23 years, the Prophet ﷺ was not only uh, not oppressed, he was actually, he had conquered the entire Arabian Peninsula. And all of those people were, were begging mercy f from him, even though they deserved to be, to be recompensed with, with punishment. The Prophet ﷺ forgave them. And this is the difference between somebody who's purified, whose heart is pure, and somebody whose heart is impure. The impure people oppress. And the pure people not only forgive their oppressors, but they actually conquer them by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they elevate them. They actually elevate them to a state. And this is what Muslims have to recognize, that we have to purify ourselves. And, and this is what this book is. It's a book of self-purification. And if we take it seriously, if we work on our hearts, if, if, if we actually implement these things, we'll begin to see changes in our lives, see changes around us, see changes within our own family dynamics. If we begin to impl implement these things, and that's why it's a blessing that we have this book, and it's a blessing that uh, this teaching still exists in our community. And what's left for us really is to take that teaching upon ourselves, to take it seriously. And so we're going to go, inshallah, through these diseases of the heart that have been clearly... Uh, 
articulated by this great scholar, and we're going to look at the diseases beginning with bukhul, miserliness, to look at its etiology, to look at, in other words, what caused it, to look at uh, how, what are the signs and symptoms, and then to look at what are those things that we can do to treat it. There are two types of treatment. There is a theoretical. In other words, there's things to understand about it because it actually helps to understand your disease. And then there's things that are practical. There's things that we need to do to actually change it. If you use the techniques that are given by the imams, you will see results. But it's just like the prescription that the doctor gives you. The doctor can only write a prescription. He can, he can give you the medicine, but he cannot force you to take it. This, this is what's left for us to do. It's left for us to take the medicine. But the imams have given us the medicine. Our teaching is there. It's clear. It does work. And it's something that we can change ourselves with it. And if we do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that uh, we'll be rewarded in this world and in the next. So what's left for us now is, is to go through these uh, diseases, inshallah, and then to set out and implement them, inshallah.